morning. Welcome to St. Timothy's for worship for the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. The order for Holy Eucharist, Rite 2, begins on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be His kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we, we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church by the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching that we may be made a holy temple acceptable in you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns in you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Genesis. God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. 
But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 13, responding at the asterisk. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I have perplexity in my mind and grief in my heart day after day? How long shall my enemy triumph over me? Look upon me and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep in death. Lest my enemy say, I have prevailed over him. And my foes rejoice at my fall. But I put my trust in your mercy. My heart is joyful because of your saving help. I will sing to the Lord, for he has dealt with me richly. I will praise the name of the Lord most high. A reading from the Paul from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourself to God as though who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. What then? Shall we, should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from Sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to a greater and greater inequity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free to regret to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, 
whoever welcomes you wel welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. And whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of the prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will, will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of the disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. I'd like to talk to you today about the reading in Genesis, even though I usually preach on the gospel, because I think it's important to us today. I think that we all feel that we were sort of walking through the valley of the shadow of death, 23rd Psalm with COVID graphs and death counts and children being kept from their friends, their children being kept from play and from joy, and their children being kept from their grandparents, from us, sequestered and hidden away, locked away. Death. But in a way, this makes us even cherish life more and hold our family and friends close to us. And we talk to them we visit with them, even if we have to do it over Zoom or a telephone. I miss our grandchildren, and they're off. And this reading today is important to us as Christians. It's important to Jews. It's important to Muslims. These three religions are called Abrahamic faiths, largely after the reading today, because of Father Abraham. Now, we start our worship year uh, coming up to Christmas each year. The Jews start their worship year, their worship prayer circle, uh, based around their Jewish New Year. The Jewish New Year this year is going to be on September 18th. That's their Jewish New Year. And at that time, they start their worship cycle. And the worship cycle starts with Genesis 1-1, with the creation of the earth. The very second Sabbath, the very second Saturday in their worship year, they do this reading that we did today. It's called the Kaida. It's the story of the binding and the near sacrifice of Abraham's son Isaac, his only loved son. And each year, the Jews and all of us have to struggle with the story of the binding and the near sacrifice of Isaac. We struggle collectively with the psychological impacts and the ethical impacts of this story. How could a father, a loving father, a man who was a hundred years old at that time, be willing to sacrifice his son? How did Abraham feel about that? And how did his son Isaac feel about it? Abraham tricked Isaac. He didn't tell him what was going to go on. He was going to take him to the mountaintop. He was going to tie him down. And he was going to offer him a burnt, as a burnt offering to God. And even more strangely, Abraham did not tell his wife Sarah. At least it's not recorded in the book. So he was deceiving his wife also. This story has touched millions of hearts, actually billions, for several thousand years as he led us in the path of God. And just incidentally, do you know where that mountaintop was that Abraham took Isaac to, to sacrifice? That mountaintop was Jerusalem, Temple Mount. That's why it's worshipped for all three faiths. In the mountaintop, Abraham was holding the neck of Isaac and it's out that mountaintop that Jesus came down and touched him and saved him. So what does it mean to these three faiths? All three faiths know that God is telling them not to sacrifice children. 
That's an obvious message in this. No more burnt offerings of your children to God. But the other thing is, is there's slightly different interpretations for each one of the three faiths. I've heard it said that the Jews respond to this every second Sabbath day of their year when they hear it. And their comment by a lot of them is, this is why we are strong, because God is standing with us. This is why we exist, surrounded by Arab Islamic armies around us. This is why, because we were, because we listened to God's word and we obeyed, even to the point of sacrificing an only son, beloved son. But Christian scholars have a slightly different approach of this. When this Christian scholars see this passage as pre-configuring Jesus sacrificed on the cross. Other Christians see this period as Isaac. It's a type of the word of God who prefigured Christ. So Christ, Jesus was sacrificed on the cross for us. And God didn't send an angel down to, to save him. There are those who said when he was on on the cross, why not, if you are really God, God will send angels down to save you. And God didn't do that. He went even further than Abraham did. In this case, it was a ram, not a lamb, that was ultimately sacrificed in Isaac's place. That ram was caught in the bushes, in the thorn bush. And written even later in the New Testament, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him when he was being baptized. And he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Thus the binding is compared to the crucifixion and the last minute stay of sacrifice as a type of resurrection. It's like Abraham's son was resurrected because he was saved by God. And we are saved Conversely, by Jesus' crucifixion. For Muslims, they see this as a call to serve and serve without question. Some of their theologians in there have looked at this and they said, they tell the story a little different. They say that Abraham told Isaac, you're going to be sacrificed. And Isaac said, Yes, Father, I need to be sacrificed. Now, to me as a Christian, that sounds a lot like a child putting a bomb on their vest. <laughs> but that's the way they see it. And they see it as their strength. They see it as unquestioning obedience. But Father Abraham, and this story is written in all three books. Of course, we use the Old Testament, which is the Jewish worship book. And Father Abraham is the father of all those three religions, the three Abrahamic religions. I've looked in the Quran, in chapter 19, it's the whole book dedicated to Mary, our Virgin Mary. And it says in part in chapter 19 on Mary, in the scripture, when she withdrew from her people to an Eastern location, and she screened herself away from them. And we, meaning God, sent out to her our spirit. And he appeared to her as an immaculate human, which we in our Bible see this as the archangel Gabriel. And Gabriel said, I am only the messenger of your Lord to send you the gift of a pure son. And Mary said, how can I have a son? When no man has touched me, that was never unchast. Gabriel said, Thus said your Lord, It is easy for me, and we will make a sign for humanity and have mercy from us. It's a matter already decided. And in verse 34, it talks about the Son was born, whose name is Jesus, Son of Mary, the word of truth by which they doubted. And in, that, in their scripture in the Quran, it also mentioned Abraham as a man of truth and a prophet, a man 
speaking the words of God. Vows and commitment is throughout this reading, throughout the importance. I think of our marriage vows when we say in sickness and health for richer or poor, we will say, I do, I will. Not just before our spouse, not just before our family sitting in the pews and our other loved ones, but we say, I do, I will, before God, represented by the priest who attests to our marriage vows. In a way, those of us who are married know that we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death with our spouses as well as with God. And we say the same thing of this undying commitment in our baptismal vows. When we are asked, do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? And you answer, I renounce them. I will follow you, God, to the ends of the earth. And at this time, with COVID around, I think of our doctors and nurses. And they walk into the valley of the shadow of death with us, and they hold our hands. And they comfort us, and they try to heal us. And they wear a mask and a face shield. And they may need to console us or their families, because they're truly doing God's work. They walk with us in joy if we can be healed from this terrible disease. They jump with joy figuratively if they're not too, too exhausted, if we can be healed and walk out of that hospital. And we thank the police and the firemen, and even the checkers at the grocery store doing God's work, risking this disease, walking through the valley of the shadow. I recently watched a movie on TV called The Healer. And The Healer by Touch doesn't know he's a healer. A few scenes later, he healed his 14-year-old girl from cancer. And she wrote this poem to him as a thank you. That poem says, we all at some point stop breathing. What if we lived one breath at a time? Now we speak as though breathing is easy because it's innate. And half the time, we don't even notice our breath. And when did our breath become that uncool kid that other body parts ignored? Think about the phrase, you've got to catch your breath. You have to catch it because you've lost control of it. We all need to find control over our breath and live today as if it's our last day. That's what this reading is about, Abraham sacrificing Isaac. We have to lose control. We have to give up to God. We have to let God drive our car, let him drive our life. We need to cherish life. We need to cherish our loved ones, our spouse, our children and grandchildren, our family and our friends, even strangers who are our brothers and sisters of God our Father. We need to hold them close. We need to hug them and kiss them, at least spiritual if we can't do it physically and cherish the God who loves and heals and comforts. Thank God for those who are doing your work, for being his hands, doing his holy work. Are we doing, are we doing all we can to help his work? I think about that in the dismissal that we as deacons are called to give in all the Episcopal churches. When we say, go in peace, to love and serve the Lord, Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God. Let us reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the one being with the Father. Through him all things are made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, 
by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate for the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds to the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Through baptism we have made alive in Christ Jesus. Let us speak the words of this new life by praying for the whole state of Christ's church and the world, saying, Lord, have mercy. For our presiding bishop, Michael, and our own bishop, Megan, our retired bishop, Barry, those who minister in this church and the whole church, that we might be faithful willing to serve, constant in grace, and receptive to newness. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, that we might be eager to welcome, diligent in prayer and generous in deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our nation, town, and neighborhood, that we might be advocates of the lowly defenders of liberty and models of justice. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For those who grieve, those in places of care, and those in prison, those who are addicted, those who are despondent, and all those in need, especially the campfire survivors and their families, Charlie, Bob, Phil, Donna, Kathleen, Kay, Emerita, Shirley, Anne, Parker Jane, Elisa, Helen, Dick and Pat, Marianne, Eli, Cindy, and Robert, as well as those for whom now we pray, silently or aloud. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For those in dangerous occupations, those who care for the sick, those who work the land, those who engage in commerce, and those who teach. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For all who travel, who seek rest, who visit family and friends, who enjoy the gifts of creation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For our families, and for all placed under our care, for our enemies, and for those whom we disagree, for the Christians of the Holy Land, and for those who are examples of grace in our lives, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. Yours, O God. Yours, O God, is the dominion, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins, our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who in the first day of the week overcame death and the grave by his glorious resurrection, opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven forever, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy. Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In union, O Lord, with the faithful at every altar of your church where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, we desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. We present to you our souls and bodies with the earnest wish that we may always be united to you. And since we cannot now receive you sacramentally, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. We unite ourselves to you and embrace you with all the affections of our souls. Let nothing ever separate you from us. May we live and die in your love. Amen. Now spend a few moments in meditation upon the fact that God so loved you that he sent his only begotten Son into the world for you. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we're bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, you have bound us together in a common life. Help us in the midst of our struggles for justice and truth to confront one another without hatred or bitterness, and to work together with mutual forbearance and respect. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And grant, O God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart and especially the hearts of the people of this land that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease. That our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now go forth to the world of peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. 
Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessed of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace, love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. alleluia. alleluia.